Activist or ally intentions often get caught in the slippage between advocacy and imperialism. Natalie Cory Toy also notes that the real circumstances that force targets or um, marginalized groups of people to reluctantly call for international solidarity are in conflict with the pragmatic uses of first world citizenship to mobilize solidarity. And we see this play out a lot uh, in a play out in a lot of African countries when it comes to queer rights, where they are dismissed or repressed as agents of regime change. Because of the uneven power dynamics and the power of dominance and dependency inherent in international solidarity, causes and issues can easily be hijacked to push political or neoliberal or imperialist agendas, and this very reality makes for readily available um, justifications by despotic governments to dismiss or ignore at best, or demonize, repress, or persecute at worst, say, causes, and in this case, queer rights activism. It reinforces the tragic misconceptions that being queer is a Western import or an un-African thing because of the associations with queer activism with international um, allies. Our communities need to engage with difference. I don't care how you feel about homosexuality as an individual. I don't want you to love everyone. I don't care what your religion says about two men having sex or two women having sex or two men loving each other or two women loving each other or three people loving each other. I don't care what, how you conceive that. However, you must understand that your right to that religious expression the rights to your freedom of expression are intricately la linked to other people's rights. So while Lubuntu denotes a sense of interdependence, it also recognizes the unconditional sphere of personhood, respect, dignities, values of acceptance. Uh, to put it simple, when we say, at least in my language, we say umuntu, umuntu mabantu, we also implied that abantu, abantu umuntu. Yes. If community is an essential condition to personhood, mm -hmm. then the assumption in that claim is that personhood must exist. So how do these concepts help us? Um, as Lama pointed out, I think, we've celebrated too quickly. Because for as long as there is an oppressed person in this country, on grounds that are explicitly prohibited by the Constitution, all of us should see that as an unfreedom for all of us. More importantly, those expression of oppression, black people oppressing other people, are simply expressions of internalized oppression. We continue to regurgitate the notion that certain things are un-African because we haven't taken time to interrogate the concept of Africanism. What does it mean? If you're going to tell us something is an African and be willing to murder someone over it, you should at least be able to explain what does it mean to you. No. Yes.
believe that the juxtaposition of HIV and queer identity in Africa has led to the sexualization, I think that's an actually actual word. The next one I'm going to say, I don't think is an actual word. And let me hope I can get it. The disisification yes. of queer identity. Yes. Okay? So, this juxtaposition has basically made queer ident reduced queer identities to sex and disease. And so we couldn't talk about who we were as individuals, our identities as queer folks, if we weren't talking about sex or if we weren't talking about a disease. And at the time, a disease that was a death sentence. And it's important to interrogate how this has affected how the discourse, how this has affected the discourse on queer inclusion, queer acceptance, queer equality in many of our African contexts. And so, um, I'll just quote a few individuals. Um, a guy called Tom Ballerstoff traces the history of the term MSM. So that was a term I was asked to speak, speak about. But MSM means men who have sex with men. Okay? And it was a, a term that was initi initiated as an attempt by public health, epidemiologists, and health professionals to separate the behavior the sexual activity that was high risk for <coughs> HIV from the identity of the persons who practiced it, okay? And it was initially intended to expand HIV efforts to men who have sex with men, including those who may not identify as gay. And it was, cons so that was how the history of this, this term came. But it also formed a very nice cover for countries who didn't want to talk about gay people in their communities, or the fact that gay was a reality of their cultural context. So it was easy to say, let's talk about this thing that they are doing, not who they are. And so we've carried the baggage of MSM. And increasingly now I'm hearing WSW, and it infuriates me. Not because I do not think that women who have same-sex erotic relationships should be part of the HIV conversation. But because I think that we need to interrogate the terms we appropriate to ourselves and to our struggles much more deeply. Especially when we have the benefit of the baggage of another group that has carried a similar burden. You know, we shouldn't just appropriate these things. <laughs> Thank you. 
notion of global LGBTQ solidarity has to be, has to be widely challenged and criticized for its ethnocentricity and insensitivity to cultural difference as it is often met by, logical polit uh, by local political powers and structures as an imposition of Western values. And we saw this happen in Kenya not too long ago when President Obama attempted to advocate for queer rights on his visit there. So as legitimate as that, and as, as legitimate and as justified and important and urgent as that call was, was the fact that it was coming from the United States or the President of the United States made it easy for the government to dismiss that and get support from majority of the population in mm -hmm. Kenya. It doesn't help that, as articulated by Carl F. Steiden in his study, Same-Sex Sexualities and the Globalization of Human Rights Discourse, that there indeed has been a globalization of same-sex sexualities as identities at an individualistic or cosmopolitan perspective, while at the same time, I mean, at, at the same time, there has been a general distrust of globalization and the critique thereof as a form of neocolonialism, as well as when there has been a resurgence in pan-Africanism and a push, even at AU level, towards a more communalist um, framework. These two things, Steiden argues, are more likely to come into conflict as opposed to actually com um, complement each other. celebrated not just as a gay man but as an anti party hero and HIV AIDS um, activist. So I think, I don't know, um, we, we need to stop thinking as ourselves as um, gay people or LGBTI people but as black LGBTI people who are also directly or indirectly affected by HIV AIDS. We shouldn't see heterosexual black people as allies. We are part of that community. We're not in our own bubble. And as well, black people fighting against the race, they do exclude LGBTI issues. They bubble themselves. And as LGBTI people, we also need to burst that bubble that they are forming because we are also black. We are also part of that um, issue. HIV AIDS, um, directly or indirectly, you are also affected by that. So when there are talks against HIV, HIV AIDS stigma, you are affected, you are allowed to be in that space, you are not an ally, you are within that space. So we need to broaden our thinking and our um, space in order to fight against the oppressions that Samuel Gordon is 
fighting against the place. So in 1994, as you know, as a black person, you got your rights and then suddenly it was free. So now we're saying human rights must be problematized because they give us this false kind of assurance that we are fine, we are, we are, we are accepted, we are everything. Um, this is what decolonization aims. Decolonization aims to actually change the mind state of people to exist. Yeah, because rights written on paper don't really do anything for us in the streets. When you walk in the streets, there's, some, there's still some men who look at me, for example, and say, no, but why is she being a woman? Or why is she being a woman and a man? You know, let me rape her. Whereas I think it's human rights that are, that are protecting you on paper. So we, we're now saying we all need to have a decolonial mindset and we need to take that to the streets, not human rights. Okay, human rights can be there, but we need to actually work the ground and, and that, that's, that's why I actually, I actually like what she said about um, besting or the gay bubble or what, 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 what that is because I feel like that, that those are the things that, that actually kill us, you know, having the bubble and, and, and restricting ourselves to certain things. So yeah, as I was saying... Um, the, the thing that happened with Pastor Anderson when he was prevented from coming to the country with at least hatred. The question is that since there's so much hatred in the country already, which hatred will we, 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 we as a country try not to prevent from coming in? And when the country took that stance of preventing hate, was it more of a politically was it more of a sense of like the country trying to create this facade that the country is like very like openly gay and like accepting even though there's hatred that's right in the country and there are so many issues that are not being addressed in the country already so which hate are we preventing from coming in when there's so much accent already? That's my question. I always, my, my biggest question around um, the term of MSM, I always thought that it wasn't just about sexual activity. For me, I always thought that MSM is actually just about a political um, kind of counter to how gayness has um, in many ways been, been framed and for many people the reason why they don't identify as gay but would much rather just sleep with other men is because sometimes the the image of the lifestyle, the image of what it means to be gay just doesn't, you know, appeal to them. For a lot of people, like, they just stand ideologically, you know. So how do, um, so given what you were saying, how do we then engage those kind of people? Because politically it's hard to find them. But it's like it, it, amongst our communities, it's really hard to point them out. Whereas the most extremely feminine gay guys and stuff like that, they are <laughs> easy to go to. So I'm saying, how do we um, bring in those people to our thank you. Let me just quickly um, thank the following groups um, or individuals um, who would like to acknowledge this, uh, the Constitution Hill for their continued support. Thank you very much for the venue. Thank you very much for the resource support. And uh, we hope that uh, our, our relationship will continue and grow bigger than this. Uh, secondly, we would like to acknowledge our new partner and sponsor the other foundation who are continuously making sure that um, um, initiatives that are directed or aimed at addressing LGBTI issues are supported financially, are supported with regards to resources and otherwise. Thank you very much to uh, the other foundation. We also want to thank um, our other partner and sponsor, uh, First Prize, which we are working with for the next project that I highlighted um, earlier on, which we'll be uh, informing you about. And with regards to the Q&A session, we really apologize that um, uh, because of time, we won't be able to um, answer the questions now. However, we would like to invite you to uh, like our page, Simon Ngoni Memorial, on Facebook, where all the speakers will um, uh, answer the questions that we addressed uh, today. And if there are any further questions, um, they will be able to address them on that uh, particular platform. We also urge you to uh, like the page as well, tell your friends, your family, and uh, your colleagues to like the page because uh, we need more support. From here, we uh, are growing. So thank you very much. Amen.
Bye-bye.